Good morning. Good morning. That was a little weak. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome this morning to First Baptist Church of Middlesboro. We are excited to have each of you with us. If you are visiting with us this morning, if you would take the insert in your bulletin, it's the flap on the side, and fill that out and place that in the offering plate later on in the service so that we may have a record of your attendance. Um, if you'll turn with me to the inside of your bulletin, we'll go over this week's announcements. There are several inserts. <laughs> um, one of those is about um, the week of prayer for international missions. Um, please take some time to read that. We are starting our missions offering emphasis um, for the month of December. Out front here in the vestibule, if you will notice, there's a basket there. And as we um, receive offering for that, um, for those missions offerings, you'll see bread begin to, begin to form in that basket. Each loaf of bread um, equals $500. And so our goal here is 6,000. So, if you will take note of that. Um, tomorrow is the first Monday in December, and so we need your cookies. So if you're on the cookie brigade for the month of December, if you could just bring those by the church office by noon. Also, there are two meetings this week, um, the library committee meeting and the grief support meeting. If you're interested in each of those, the times and locations are listed there in the bulletin. Um, live nativity sign-ups are taking place right now, and if you will head out the back of these stairs and go right downstairs there as you enter the TEL Chapel, there's a sign-up sheet. There are several spots, so if you have any questions about that, please see Betty Nagel. Um, there is a deacons meeting next, next Sunday, and I believe um, the last announcement is that Wednesday, December 7th, is the carols and choirs, and so that will take place at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. It should be a great time. Um, there are singers of all ages that will be participating in that event on Wednesday night. So, singers of all ages, it will be here in the sanctuary at 6.30. Following that will be the birthday party for Jesus, and that is where we take up the toys for CCM. So, if you can please bring those unwrapped on Wednesday night, um, that is when that will take place. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> as we sing together our hymn of praise as we stand together please come thou long expected Jesus number 77 in your hymnal
Let us pray. Dear Lord, you have given us another day where we can come into your house and worship you. We thank you so very much for this privilege, for it is a privilege. You are our maker. You have given us everything that we have, including this day to worship you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you also gave us, because he was a living example to us of how we should live our lives. Even though we fall <clears throat> far short of what we should be, we can always look to the example of Jesus to know how we should live our lives. Thank you for the Holy Bible that we have that gives us a written record of what Jesus has done and helps to remind us of how we should live our lives, not only through his actions, but also through his parables, that we would have examples of how to live our lives in a way that will be pleasing to you. Because our only purpose is to worship you as your children, as your creation. And now let us pray the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I ask all our children to come down for our children's message this morning. If you'll come join me up on the steps. so happy to see all of y'all this morning and I'm looking over here at a wreath this funny thing on our communion table that has candles on it and it has a white candle and purple candles and a pink candle and then it has some stuff around it and we use that wreath and we call it the advent wreath because advent means coming so we're remembering that Jesus is coming at Christmas and you know, he came to us in a manger, didn't he? He was born in a manger and Mary and Joseph took care of him. But there's a couple of things on that Advent wreath that I want to point out to you today that remind us of Christmas. What colors do you see around the bottom of the Advent wreath, girls? What colors do you see over there? You see some green? Does anybody see green? There's that holly over there. Yeah, we see green, don't we? Green is a very beautiful color at Christmas time. We see it everywhere. And in our Advent wreath, it reminds us that God is always with us. Even when winter comes and everything's bare and the leaves have fallen off some of the trees, the evergreen trees remind us of God's eternal presence with us. He's always with us. And the fact that, you know, if we trust Christ as our Savior, then we have the hope of eternal life and confidence in that. There's another color in there that, that's a red berry. Do you all see that in there too? See the little red berries? And you see a lot of red with green at Christmas time. And the red reminds us traditionally of the fact that Jesus died for us and gave his life for us. And so that we might know his grace and his love in our lives. And so the colors of the Advent wreath are very, very important to remind us that God is always with us and that he loved us so much that he gave his son for us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Let's thank God for the blessings of Christmas and Advent. God, we thank you that all around us are reminders of your love. The birds, the way you care for them, the beautiful trees of your nature, the animals, all that we see reminds us of your care and of your love and of your creation. And we ask during this season to remind us every day of our lives 
of how grateful we can be for your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you please join me in the litany for Advent as we light the candle of peace? Why light a candle that will burn out? The message of this candle cannot be quenched. It speaks of peace. No war can halt. Peace, no heartache can sever. Peace, no suffering can erase. It represents the advent peace of the promised Messiah, before whom all nations must bow. The second advent candle denotes peace, not the cessation of conflict, not the absence of suffering, nor the loss of struggle, but the saving peace of God in the midst of everything. Here goes the light for peace. You see a candle of peace burning. What is your response? God does not give peace like the world gives. God's peace has its understanding. God's peace exists in the midst of turmoil. God's peace forgets what it forgives and lives to say. Our peace is not God who first loved us. <laughs> As you've already heard, our um, mission offering theme this year is Bread of Life. And remember that you can designate your offering to the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, which is Global Missions, or American Baptist, which is the World Mission Offering. If you don't designate your offering, it will be given um, equally to all three. However you choose to give, no that the money that we give is going to be used to spread the message of Christ around the world. Today, Emily holds in her hand our first loaf of bread, representing the $500. Um, and so we, we need to see this multiply over the next few weeks. During a storm in Nepal, a poor Buddhist family lost its cows, worrying that the cow that the cows, their only means of survival, would be killed by the storm or the mountain lions, the family went out to search for them. As they searched, the storm worsened, and the family feared that their cows would be lost forever. The wife started praying to every god she could think of, asking for a sign to find the cows. Finally, she gave up. Hearing his wife's cries, the husband remembered a missionary had talked to him about the miracles of Jesus. The husband prayed to Jesus to help him to find the cows. Immediately, the clouds lifted and there stood the cows. His family now follows Jesus exclusively and he is learning to share his testimony and the gospel uh, with his family and with friends. Let us pray. Father, we know that new life, new hope, new dreams, do come to those who hear and receive the bread of life. We thank you for our missionaries around the world who carry this message. Father, we know that though we may not be able to be in another country sharing Christ personally with others, that you have given us too the holy task of sharing Christ with others. Help us to be faithful in that calling as we give our mission offering and help us to be faithful throughout the year and praying for missions and for our missionaries. These things we ask in your name. Amen. And now Emily will take the first loaf of bread and put it in our basket, which is in the vestibule. Emily, thank you. We'll be singing our theme song today, the Bread of Life that was written by Ken Miedema. It's an insert in your bulletin. Before we do that, I'd like you to take an opportunity to greet those around you this morning. And as soon as you have done that, we'll sing. Please stand.
Would you please turn with me to Psalms 85 as we read together all the verses. Psalms 85. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to Foley. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your unfailing love and peace. God, we live in a world that is at war, a time of year that is incredibly hectic. Lord, may we feel your comfort. We confess to you, God, that we often do not seek you first, but you are faithful to forgive us. God, we lift up to you those who are hurting and those who are grieving this holiday season. God, we are reminded at Advent that you sent your son to earth. Jesus walked this earth. May we reflect more on what the season means than our shopping lists. May we be reminded of what we have. This week, pictures have flooded the television screens of pictures of New Orleans, of families who are returning to their homes for the first time in three months, God. They are saddened by what they see and what they find. May we be reminded that our hope is not in things that are material, but things that are eternal. We lift up those who have been hurt by that storm, who will be experiencing this season in a new town, in a new city. We don't understand why these things happen, God, but you are faithful. And may we be reminded of the peace that you bring. In your name we pray. Amen. The first to announce the peace and the birth of our Savior were the angels. Let's sing hymn number 94, Angels from the Realms of Glory, as we stand.
before I give the offertory prayer. This past year, I have been blessed in being able to go down to the Gulf Coast and see Christians in action. They would not have been able to do as much as what they were able to do, except because of offerings that we give to our local churches and through our local uh, missions of faith. Those gifts were the first sign that people of a disaster were able to see Christian love in action after the hurricanes. So think long and hard as you prepare this morning to give your gifts. And remember, we as Christians can do more through our gifts and our tithes and offering than you can possibly imagine. The gifts that we give here today will be blessed by God and be multiplied in great numbers to help those that we may never see but will know God because of what we have done today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so very much for the great blessings that you have given us, for the church that we have to worship you in that was a gift by you. Thank you for our jobs, our income that we have got because you have trained us in our different occupations so that we can earn a living and feed our own families. Because you have done so much for us, Lord, please open our hearts so that we know to give back our tithes to you so that you may bless them and spread them out to where they are needed. Bless these offerings that we are about to give so that your word can be spread throughout the world and you can be glorified to all nations. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Would you please turn with me to the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark as we read together verses 1 through 8. It's on page 990 in your pew Bibles. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, and make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region, and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this message, the message of John, who previewed the way to come. May we be previews to others of your love. In your name we pray. Amen. We see previews all the time. Previews to the latest movie, or the latest episode of CSI, or ER. Previews to movies, TV shows, or expectations of a sports season can often be misleading. Previews to movies may make them look like great comedies, only to discover that everything funny about the movie had already been seen in the preview. Or your favorite football team starts the season with the number three spot in the polls and ends the season five and six, not even making a bowl. These previews are meant to prepare us for what is to come. The movie preview can make it or break it. If the preparation is not done well, if the expectation is not there, all is lost. Mark's gospel does not start with the nativity or any of the information given in Matthew or Luke. There's no genealogy. There's no talk of Mary or Joseph. It doesn't even give us the word made flesh of John. Mark's preview is solely given in the ministry of John the Baptist. We hear nothing about the birth of John, but start with the prophecy of Isaiah and John's ministry. The preview John is giving in his ministry is the one of Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah that was to come was the expected King of Kings, Emmanuel, the long-awaited Messiah who was to come and fulfill Jewish prophecy. But no one thought that the King of Kings would arrive in a manger, born of an unwed mother, in a barn. He was a carpenter, a Messiah who would eat with sinners and touch the ones who lived outside the city gates. A man who would speak to a Samaritan woman and wash the feet of his own disciples. A man who would not take over as ruler, but be killed on a Roman cross. Jesus came and spoke more about attitudes instead of strict observance of the laws. Why does the Gospel of Mark start with John and not Jesus? Why start with this man out of the wilderness? The wilderness would have significance to the people in Mark's audience. Many important events had come out of the wilderness. It holds significance in the Old Testament and salvation history. Exodus gives us a story of when Moses found himself in a difficult situation after killing the Egyptian. The king was looking for him, so he fled to the wilderness of Midian. After his time in this foreign land, Moses was called to lead the Hebrew people out of Egypt. In 1 Samuel, we are told of a time when David went into the wilderness when Saul was in pursuit of him and out to kill him. He was saved from Saul's sword and eventually found himself in a situation where Saul was asleep, once again in the wilderness. 
And David would have been able to kill Saul, but he didn't. He convinced his soldiers that God had made Saul king and that this position must be honored. David took a piece of Saul's robe, and when Saul awoke, he, he talked with him, and David told him that he would not kill him. He showed him a piece of the robe to prove his good intentions. He had a chance, and he didn't take it. And so Saul blessed David and his future as king and asked him to spare his descendants. Elijah's time in the wilderness is given to us in 1 Kings. Elijah fled in fear for his life, and there in the wilderness, the Lord spoke to Elijah. The wilderness connection is without a doubt an important element of the life of John. Jesus will also emerge to speak out of the wilderness on several occasions. He spends time in prayer in the wilderness. Even John's diet emphasizes life in the wilderness away from the royal life of meat and wine. This diet could also mark John as a prophet. We are still familiar with stories of people changed by the wilderness experience. This is why we encourage retreats and time spent away, time spent alone with God. There is a story of Aaron Ralston, a man who went out into the wilderness of the Canyonlands of Utah. He went out to hike and later found himself between a rock and a hard place, which is the title of his book about the experience. He was trapped by a boulder that had fallen, and his hand was stuck. After five days, he ended up amputating his own arm below the elbow and rappelling down 65 feet and hiking another seven miles to find help. He came out of the wilderness, not only changed spiritually, but emotionally, by having faced his own death and having chosen survival. Because the people of the first century knew the connections between salvation history and the wilderness, the connection with John the Baptist and the wilderness is an important one. The gospel writer describes John and makes a connection to Elijah. A passage from Isaiah is quoted here in Mark 1, verses 3 and 4. It is a passage that talks of the one who will prepare the way and is here related to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one set to lead the way. The coming Messiah had been talked about for years, centuries even. But John speaks not just of the one to come, but of a baptism of repentance. This is not the customary ritual of purification for Gentiles who convert to Judaism, but a repentance and purification for all, even the Jews. They could not just rely on the heritage and genealogy of being Jewish. The Jews were the chosen people of God. They could point to the temple and what had been told by some of the prophets. They clutched to the law and the stature that came with being the chosen people of God. It never occurred to them that God's grace could be for all people. That attitude would matter more than heritage and law. They too would need purification. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance, one of change and of cleansing. Renewal as a preparation to receive the one who is to come. For this audience, preparation for a different type of kingdom. There was preparation needed. We prepare for things all the time. We prepare for retirement, set up college funds, invest in life insurance for the times after we are gone. People often prepare a way for the future, for results they will not see. Living their life for their passion and pursuits, and just paving the way for those who will follow. There was a man from England who became a minister. He had inherited some money from his parents and immigrated to New England in 1637. Along the way, he had obtained a good library through his education and travels. He worked as a minister in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He died at an early age of 31, but at that time bequeathed half of his estate in his 32-volume library to a new college in Cambridge. It was his passion to see that college become reality. That college is now named in his honor, in the honor of John Harvard. Susan B. Anthony spent her life as one of the main icons of the women's suffrage movement. It was her passion. She traveled and lectured all across the nations on the right to vote. 
In 1900, she even persuaded the University of Rochester to admit women. She was compassionate and active in the movement until her death in 1906. Though she worked 40 years towards an amendment that would give women the right to vote, she never saw it passed. She was even arrested after casting a vote for the 1872 presidential election. She was tried and given a fine of $100, which she refused to pay. Her life's work was to prove that voting was not a crime for women, but a right as a citizen. She prepared the way for the 19th Amendment that was made law in 1920, even though she herself would never legally vote. She prepared the way for those who would follow and for women who can now vote. Ida Miller is a woman who had a passion for music and a dream of a pipe organ being in the sanctuary of her local church in Knoxville. She participated in meetings and fundraising for the organ. She was a key player in the project and behind it every step of the way. Ida Miller later died of cancer before the project was completed last year. She never heard one note played on the pipe organ that now plays every Sunday morning in that sanctuary. Her passion and faithfulness was a driving force for that project, even though she never saw it completed. Sometimes our calling may be to be a legacy of faithfulness instead of seeing a finished product. John the Baptist was faithful to his purpose and mission, even though Jesus' ministry began after John's arrest. John was an integral part in the story of Jesus. He was a preview. It was a project like a relay race that had begun centuries before. John essentially handed the baton over to Jesus and would not see the outcome of the race in which he was a part. John began to tell of a new way of living as he spoke to his followers about repentance, about a change of heart and a turn in a new direction. Jesus, in the same way, spoke of a change, a focus more on attitude than on strict observance of the law. Jesus would heal on the Sabbath and even clear out the marketplace and the temple courts. Jesus spoke of love and grace, a new kingdom, and a new commandment. John the Baptist gave a preview of what was to come, a God who would baptize with the Holy Spirit, bringing a new communion with God. John prepares the people for the Messiah by consecrating them with water. Jesus would consecrate them by bringing the Holy Spirit. The good news in Mark is that the prophecy is about to be fulfilled and the Messiah, the long expected one, is coming. Just as John prepared the way for Jesus, may we hear the call to reform our lives and prepare a way for the Lord in our obedience and thoughts. May we be previews of God's love. As we live out our daily lives, our obedience and response to his grace is a living witness that God came to earth and still draws near to us this day. If you would like to have a relationship with this God of love and grace, the invitation is always open. The altar is open here to, for prayer, and you are welcome at any time to become a member of this congregation. Would you please stand as we sing our hymn of invitation? It will be number 208. Love divine, all love excelling. Would you stand? Would you sing?
welcome this morning Glenn Smith to our congregation from Riverside Baptist. He is transferring his letter today. So after the end of the service, if you would please make your way down here to welcome Glenn. Um, he would love to meet all of you. Also, um, Fred Diddy's birthday is today. He is 86 years old. And so if you would um, make your way back there and say happy birthday to Fred before you leave as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Peace.